about you? How do you define and assess food security? Yeah, um, I guess as a company and, and just an urban dweller, um, I look a lot towards kind of urban food security um, and also the urban food system. So I, I, I'd assess kind of food security around um, the access to farmers markets, green markets, um, and where those are um, strategically being offered um, and the demographics of people that are able to go um, and, and afford the, those types of food. I think also, I agree with everything that's been said, but another element here um, to, to kind of, that should be encapsulated in food security is also the time and the knowledge um, to prepare food um, and be able to have that relationship with um, the food that that you have um, and also not, you know, having food not be a, a sticking point or an anxiety point because it should be, you know, nourishment um, nutritionally and mentally. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned you're an urban dweller. Can you specify which uh, urban places is home to you? Uh, yeah, so I, I live in New York City. Uh, right now I'm in, I'm in Wyoming. Um, I escaped the madness. Um, Luckily, but yeah, as a, as a urban dweller um, in, in New York, we're fortunate to have, you know, a very abundant um, network of green markets that are affordable and that do offer um, opportunities to um, marginalized communities, systemically silenced communities, um, to access those, those um, really important um, venues. Uh, to, to, to really have a connection with food. So that's, you know, that's kind of my lens into um, the importance of local, local and, and diverse food systems. Great, thanks for elaborating on that. And we're gonna um, dive into everything each of you just said in a minute. So I'm gonna um, pass the mic back to Shabrina first and, and just ask you a little bit more about Florida Impact and what you do there. So uh, Shabrina, I know, um, a lot of your work and your interest and, and passion is for addressing the social determinants of health. I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about um, what is something you think that maybe people don't always understand about that and what's something you think that all of the attendees on this webinar should understand about social determinants of health? Yeah, sure. So I think it's very important for people to know that the social determinants of health vary from place to place. And at least with our nonprofit, we see that even when we go from Miami Gardens into Homestead, we have to change our approach because every community has a different challenge posed to it. Um, I guess the most specific example I can bring about is that in Miami Gardens, there's an uh, issue with the lack of access to transportation, where in Homestead, there's a lot of language barriers. So definitely knowing and identifying those social determinants of health can help uh, programs nag Na navigate, sorry, um, which um, direction to go with their projects. Great. And in terms of your work with Florida Impact, can you um, tie that together and tell us about your focus with Florida Impact? Um, maybe talk to us a little bit about healthy retail and, and what that is. What have you encountered uh, working in healthy retail? What successes or challenges have you found there? Yeah, sure. So we launched our healthy retail project in the beginning of uh, 2020. Uh, we first started in Miami Gardens. We identified 16 stores that we would like to bring aboard to our project. And out of those 16, five signed on. So what um, the objective is to introduce more fresh produce and healthy options in the stores. So we work with a food distributor about 15 minutes away from Miami Gardens and the produce uh, is then sent to the convenience store owners to be sold at a lower price than comparative to Walmart. To, to start the project, we did it at a 50% uh, price rate because from our NEM survey, as I mentioned before, a lot of people had a misconception that produce was very expensive in the, in the city. And then we also are working on a healthy snack demolitions and also as Parker kind of touched on it, which was great, but um, signage to or like recipes because there was a barrier that people didn't feel connected to the fruits and vegetables and they thought that they lacked flav flavor and taste. So we wanted to bridge those educational gaps. That's great. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, 
do any of the other panelists have any follow-up questions to that for Jabrina before I move on to another uh, panel? What kind of fruits and vegetables were are, are kind of most popular in Homestead for those stores? Well, unfortunately, we weren't able to kick off the produce sales in Homestead because of COVID-19. We're oh. mainly starting the produce in Miami Gardens. But um, at least what has been purchased by the convenience stores were like the conventional tomatoes, bananas, apples. Sometimes there were um, some stores that ordered more ethnic fruits like and roots like malanga and bayato cubano. Um, nice. it's a, a great range. I want to shop at those stores now. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else? And then. If not, I'll, I'll hand it over to Sam, who is actually going to give us a tour of where she's at currently for our next question. Now, all right, so um, Sam, uh, before you give us a tour of, of your food pantry, I just wanted to ask you um, a bit about what you're doing there. So you play a really active role at your university advocating for food security. Uh, can you talk about how you got involved with that and maybe a bit about um, the role that a university can and, and should play in its local community advocating for food security. Yeah, so I got involved um, with our food pantry. Um, actually, kind of when I started my internship um, for the our sustainability council, and my like co intern for that position was heavily involved, and she like inspired me to like get more involved because she started the food recovery network on our campus, and she's the one that got the cardinal cupboard started um so shout out to henny ransdale she's amazing um uh, but yeah i started off as a volunteer and then this semester um there was a position that opened up and i applied um applied for it and got it and basically what i do is i help reach out to like the public um to host like um fundraisers or like um food drives and stuff like that. And I also like um, help improve our like communication with our student population because um, for a while not a lot of people knew about the, uh, our food pantry just because it was kind of in a hidden spot. But since it gained popularity and um, UofL got on board with um, what we were doing and stuff and we got like, um, like grants and stuff from like Kroger, who just helped us remodel our space. Um, Great. Kind of just like grew from there. So um, I, don't know, I was, um, I like how I was here from the beginning. So, um, as far as like how it plays a role in our local community, um, I think it plays like a pretty big role because we, um, we reach out to like um, local organizations who are involved in like the same type of work or even like restaurants and stuff uh, like local restaurants and see like how we could like help them because we've done like percentage nights um at some places where like we'll we'll promote it to like um like greek life and like um like the athletics teams and stuff and then we'll, they'll go and um go to like these local places and then like 10 percent of the profits made in like an hour time span or whatever will go to us but they get more customers than what they normally would have had on like a Wednesday night um so yeah kind of stuff like that I guess yeah that's very interesting and it's great to hear that you've been able to overcome some challenges and awareness on the campus and getting the word out there through the support of different groups and institutional support definitely goes a long way so I'm, I'm glad you were able to advocate advocate for that on your campus um, and while you've got the microphone, do you want to give us a quick little tour or give us a spin around the food pantry and show us what that looks like? Yeah, let me switch my camera real quick. If it'll work. There it is. So yeah, um, behind me we got all our produce, which Kroger just funded and, and did the whole like remodeling of the space. So we actually have a lot more drawers or shelves, I mean, and then like we have like canned goods and then we have like dried goods and like cereals and bread um and then we have like two freezers slash fridges they can be like switched to be either or um yeah great 
Um, panelists, do you have any questions for Sam about her food pantry or her work setting that up? Sam. Cool. Oh, uh, do you see, um, like, do you speak with people that visit the panel, of, sorry, not the panel, the pantry, and know um, what challenges they may face um, in Louisville? You said you're based in Louisville, right? Yeah, what was the question again? I'm sorry. You cut it out. When people visit the, pa uh, the pantry, do you know what kind of challenges they face in the, their communities? Um, well, we don't really like question students on their like financial needs because we try to keep it like an open space where people feel welcome, like regardless of what they have going on in their life. Um, because not because sometimes like food insecurity is invisible. Like you don't know if like somebody just like lost their job just because they're like wearing like nice clothes or whatever. So we do have like a small survey that we have people fill out um, where they put in their like, our like online like ID, but it's not trackable. That's just so we can track how many times like a new person uses the pantry and we track like how we're affecting like veterans and senior citizens and stuff like household demographic but other than that we don't like question about like financial issues or anything like that like it, we don't care we're just trying to uh, relieve the financial burden on students because I mean tuition is expensive and it, a, lot of, a lot of this stuff is also like um, well before COVID-19 a lot of it was stuff from our like on campus restaurants and stuff like we would get uh, leftovers from Starbucks and um, a couple of like our like cafes and stuff on campus. So a lot of it was food that would be thrown away anyway. So they may as well eat it even if they don't necessarily like need it. No, oh, that's awesome. Thank you. That's awesome that you do surveys like us as well to track the trends. Yeah. Great, thanks, Sam. Um, uh, let's go to David. So, David, I'm curious, you've done a lot of research on this. I'm curious for you to talk a little bit more about uh, organic food agriculture. Um, maybe if you could speak a bit to some perceptions or even misconceptions that people have about it. Sure. Um, I, organic agriculture is interesting um, when you're speaking to growers because it can offer a higher price point. Just as a commodity, you can make like a, a fair margin more money if you can produce it reliably and, um, and get it to market. Um, in terms of food security though, I would not really advocate for an organic type of system primarily because it's, is, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't allow for certain types of genetic technology like GMOs, which have basically been like completely like, not really completely, but it, it's just sad to see that that technology hasn't been more accepted. And um, I think that there's a great loss that is at the interest of what people want from organic agriculture. So if you want less, chemicals that are being sprayed and i'm not saying that those chemicals are necessarily being sprayed in an unsafe way but less chemicals would be much more possible if you had better access to genetic technologies as a grower because if you want disease resistance you need to be able to access that somehow and sometimes it's not possible using traditional techniques so it's kind of um it's kind of an ironic trade-off where supporting organic agriculture is actually proliferating the um, presence of chemicals in our in like in the growing of food so um just know that and so th there's i i try i try not to prioritize organic food if <laughs> when i'm making my purchasing um mostly because of that yeah that's very interesting um is there anything that you think should or could that you'd like to see happen to address that or, or change well, that? Okay, so I just saw a chat come in from Melissa. I didn't catch the last name, but I think organic labeling would be much better served if it included genetic technologies, if it allowed that. Um, 
So that's one thing. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so yeah, that would be really nice. Um, what else? Also, the, the, the GMO-free labeling is a little scary because I think it's easier to, set, to spread misinformation through fear when you have no GMOs like labeled on everything, including like table salt, which has no, <laughs> no ability to have a GMO <laughs> in it. So um, I would just like to see more kind of basically objective like assessment, like, cause if there is, if there is any risk that has nothing to do with it. I mean, so it's just kind of like, it's easy to, to, to cultivate the perception of, um, you know, we'll just be safe and just say no, but what are you, what are you risking with that? Actually quite a bit of food security. So, um, so I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't support like non GMO labeling. It's, it's not a matter of just giving people the choice. It's actually, it's actually influencing their perception in a way that's not beneficial in my opinion. Yeah. That's really interesting. Do any of the other panelists have any follow-up points or questions to that before we move on? Yeah, I have a, I have a follow-up question. Um, I guess, so what you're describing here is like, there's a lot of nuance with this term genetic modification because like we've been modifying the genetics of plants <laughs> since the birth of agriculture. So to say genetic modification or GMO free is, is actually a huge oversimplification in my eyes. Um, and I'm sure you would agree. How much can you agree more? <laughs> or what, what can we be doing um, in our organizations to convey or, or better communicate um, that nuance to, to customers that are, you know, um, you know maybe, maybe hesitant to buy a, a genetically altered or manipulated. Um, yeah, ge I'd say gene editing is the term that I hear more these days, um, which seems to more refer to doing knockouts rather than transgenics, like rather than introducing genes from other sources, which is mostly because um, basically transgenics have been outlawed in some senses, uh, whether it's from the or European Union or or the USDA organic labeling system, but um, but I, that's I mean it's a great question and it's a great point because when you do traditional breeding, you arguably or just in reality you you modify much more genetically than if you were to do transgenics because it's not targeted. You have to initially start with almost you know up to fifty percent of the genome is being swapped out when you do traditional. So I couldn't agree with more with you, Parker. I, but it's a good question because. People hear genetics or something like that and kind of sense, I mean, people aren't really familiar with it, so they're not sure. They don't want to have risk in their food. Um, but it's a very good question. I'm not sure the answer. Mm. Thanks. Um, Parker, I'm curious to see if you have any uh, answers or further thoughts on that. I'm giving you the microphone next, so um, it could be related. Can you tell us, Parker, about, about what you do? I know you focus a lot on urban agriculture and you're the founder and CEO of Grounded Upcycling. I'm wondering if you can tell us about urban agriculture, what conceptions or misconceptions are there out there about it, and what is Grounded Upcycling doing to shake up and revitalize urban ag? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I think like what I was describing with David is, is like not just with food security, but you know, everyone listening is interested in environmental uh, solutions and, and, and problem solving. And I think all of it requires a, a huge amount of ecological literacy and nuance, able to, you know, this ability to like shift um, and look at the whole system um, and not just like, you know, cast aside potential, you know, huge technology innovations like with the GMO um, example. So in urban agriculture, um, something that I'm, I'm intimately aware of and, and a part of in New York City, um, you know, we, we hear about a future getting more urban, more people are moving into um, mega cities um, for job opportunities and, and just other practical reasons. 
um, a lot of urban agriculture is is spoken about in like or examples that we see are hydroponic um, lettuce le lettuce growers, basically like high high turnover leafy greens, microgreens, um, things that are integral to your diet, um, but they aren't calorie dense. So um, you're not going to feed the world off lettuce alone. Um, so that's one of the biggest misconceptions about urban agriculture. Um, and it's something that often leads us to kind of ignore our rural food system, um, feeding into urban environments that is still you know, absolutely essential to food security. Um, but also thinking about ways that urban ag can deliver calories. Um, so as, as a founder of a mushroom farm, um, or as an agricultural supplier of mushrooms in an urban environment, I'm really interested to see how um, not only mushrooms, but other crops can be selected for urban dwellers, and also crops that you know, people can learn to uh, integrate into their own homes or into their own communities um, and learn how to grow themselves, um, and have that practical kind of self-reliance um, to learn a new skill and to um, be able to depend on their food um, more readily. So uh, Grounded is basically just trying to expand the catalog of what crops um, are, are, are spoken about in urban agriculture um, and also you know, try as best as possible to give people um, these practical tools um, and ecological literacy to, you know, take back some of their food um, so that they can, they can grow it themselves. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I mean, maybe there are some follow-up follow questions. Yeah, um, we're getting great questions from the audience that I want to dig into in a minute, but before I go to some of those, does anyone have any follow-up questions for Parker from the panel? Yeah, um, I had a question. So, I mean, y'all were y'all basically like upcycle like organic materials and stuff. Um, would y'all ever like consider like maybe doing like a composting type thing? That way you can compost more like food waste to turn into material to grow new food. Yeah, I love this question. So the way that I actually got into the business that I'm um, working on now is kind of with a fascination and to be honest, a frustration. Uh, with how urban composting is is dealt with, especially in New York City. Um, if you're if anyone's in San Francisco, more power to you. Somehow you guys figured out how to like divert all your waste. So great. Um, but yeah, so what we do um, in the lens of composting. So we're working with mushroom mycelium, which is essentially. Uh, the evolutionary power of mushroom mycelium to decompose waste is probably the best organism we have. Um, they're primary decomposers. Um, they do a lot of work for us. They're integral in, in natural ecosystems and breaking down our waste anyways. Um, so it's really biomimetic in the sense that, you know, we're working hand in hand with these, with these organisms to do a lot of the work that we need. Um, and the way that we kind of look at it is like an upside down hierarchy, like a, like a triangle. Um, the EPA put forth, you know, years ago, um, this, this hierarchy of food waste. Um, and compost, you'll find, is actually at the bottom of that hierarchy. Um, so what you should do or, or what's, what's optimal with food waste um, or waste coming out of our, our economy um, is to actually extend the life such that it goes down this trophic um, cascade, if you will. And, ca uh, and composting is actually the, you know, the last resort. Um, so we use, you know, coffee grounds are the main organic material that we work with, um, super nutrient dense, nitrogen rich, and it creates a super great environment for our mushrooms to um, capture nutrients. So, once we're done with that, the residuals from our process go to composting. Um, and it actually creates a supercharged compost input um, that rebuilds and regenerates soil. So that's kind of how we're, we're thinking about the entire um, 
kind of matter of fact reality how it pans out in in the cities awesome yeah that's very interesting parker thank you and great question sam um so we're getting lots of good questions from the audience i'm going to start diving into those uh, and the first one, it's a two-part question. Um, so I'll, I'll just ask the question and for the panelists, whoever feels like you want to jump in and take that first, go ahead. Um, so our question is, what is something you've found surprising since starting your career in food security? And the second part of that question is, what is one important thing uh, that you think everyone should understand about how they impact food security, the food security landscape? Um, so does anyone want to dive into that, the, those two questions? Yeah, I mean, I, I can start. Um, my career is not very uh, old, so I will say, like, I'm not far removed from people listening. Um, and, you know, we've been doing this urban agriculture thing, food security thing for about uh, a, a year now. Um, and now, I mean, I guess like, I can't help but go right into COVID-19 considerations and how this is kind of biology's way of screaming at us to change our ways in every single conceivable way that we can, um, and to become more resilient, um, and, you know, join organizations that are thinking about, you know, the future of not just, uh, viral pandemics but environmental stressors and shocks that are pretty much proven to be inevitable um at this point so i would just encourage everybody to consider i know that many people on this on this panel um discussion are already considering ca careers um in this direction but you know it's super rewarding work and it's also going to be super in demand so um i would encourage you to keep keep at it and, and stay motivated and, and try to figure out um, what problem or organization is speaking to you kind of most clearly. That's a great answer. Um, Shabrina, Sam, David, do you have anything to add to that? Cool. Um, well, I have I definitely a, agree I have a with to, Parker. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you had such a good answer, Parker. They can't. I <laughs> can't top it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I have a related question to that and on the note of encouraging people to become involved with, with food security. As you mentioned, there's lots of people on the panel who might be interested in, in getting into that field. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any recommendations, and Parker just made a few, about how aspiring change makers or people who want to get into the workforce, how should they get involved with food security? Um, could be academically, professionally, personally, what skill sets uh, do you recommend? And is there anything that you've done in your life that you think you would recommend to anyone attending? Um, um, I can answer that one. I, I would say just get involved. Like, I mean, before I like switched my major to sustainability and stuff, I wasn't really involved with like biology or like my previous major before I switched to sustainability, but like getting involved has like opened so many doors for me. And just like, um, like the position I am now, I started off as a volunteer like a year ago. So I would suggest like if there's like a nonprofit or organization, if they have like volunteer opportunities, but um, definitely just get your foot in the door that way. I think, I think there's, there's so many ways that you can get involved. I mean, like, I think that the, f the first thing that comes to mind for me is like supply chain because it's such a, like, such a, like integral part of whether or not the food system is working. And, um, and it's just, I remember when, when I was in grad school, it was in huge demand. I assume it's, I assume it's similarly um, a task that's in demand at, at this point. Um, but um, I mean, I, I was talking a little bit with Megan before the panel and uh, just looking at how there can be onions rotting in Idaho and none on my shelves in Philly. That's a supply, so that's a supply chain issue. 
Um, and it's like, it touches, like if you want to help small farmers, they need supply chain support to be able to get into stores. Um, I don't know. That's just a thought. I mean, there's, there's a lot of skills that can be applied to, to food security. I mean, accounting is like any, any business needs good accountants. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Parker is getting a good dose of that <laughs> running the startup. All the yeah, that's a great point. Um, Parker, were you about to say something? Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I, I kind of said this in my last um, point, but you know, if you think about what this pandemic is teaching us, it's like, it's really making us think about what is truly essential um, to, to human thriving and like abundance. And, um, you know, with careers in mind, food and, and, you know, everything kind of uh, surrounding, you know, like David's saying, the supply chain, access, um, and then, you know, a huge part of that is farming um, get you know getting engaged with those um, areas of the economy that will thrive and survive um, in the next kind of stage that we find ourselves in um, that's where you're gonna find opportunities so you know be helpful go join industries that are you know still essential um, and you'll find opportunities in there Great. Um, so another question that we've got from the audience uh, is there's been studies about how if we continue our trends and overheat the planet, we won't be able to grow any more food in 20 to 30 years. Are there steps we can take right now or genetically to genetically modify seeds so that they're able to grow in higher temperatures? David, I mean, is that something you can speak to? <laughs> oh, I was thinking I might. Um, I mean, if you wanted to project what the, in like how to how to grow something for an environment that you don't necessarily have. Well, I mean, you first if you can predict what that environment's going to be, then you'd want to like use that use something that's as similar as possible to do diversity screening. Um, and can you use genetic modification to do it? Well, I mean. For each modification, there's going to be pretty specific applications. So I, I'm i not too up on whether there's heat tolerance genes or proteins associated that with with a plant that have been successfully introgressed. But um, but if you were to, you you would ultimately have to sort of prove that it works. And and you could probably start marketing that to environments that are already similar to what the environment might change to be so it's kind of there's kind of like there's logistical things like with breeding you always have to figure out how to have a representative environment um, so you can do your basically product testing and, and figuring out like how the new genetics are are working in a commercial line and also I mean there's marketing like how do we sell this the soonest how do we make sure that we actually have products that are viable <laughs> so that is, if that's where the if that's where it's going to go with like arable land then yeah it would be i mean it would be profitable to have products that can that can suit it so i don't, I don't know i guess think about how to make money off of it <laughs> it's a very practical approach um thank you for that david and i have another question that maybe you would have um something to say too so what is the potential future for contemporary breeding programs like those conducted at UC Davis and, and Cornell to feed a growing number of people while cultivating more sustainable agriculture? Um, and how do we bring more sustainable agriculture to scale? Well, um, you know, the, the products from a breeding program don't necessarily dictate how a farmer will handle them. So, you know, like the seeds that I might have bred as a watermelon breeder, those could be grown organically or not. Um, and I think that's what you mean by contemporary breeding, like non-genetic modification. And so um, kind of touching on the last point, it's like it, it would make sense if you could kind of have your eye on where environments might be going, but it, it, that's, it is challenging. Um, but 
Yeah, I don't know. Cornell has a, some interesting programs because they're kind of, they'll develop genetics for local production, um, which is like, it's not really how a lot of companies would think of it because they want to get sort of the biggest possible markets and like New York state specifically isn't like a whopping market. If you're trying to grow a watermelon, if you're trying to market a watermelon variety, you're not just going to cut off New York state, but being able to kind of tailor it to that and they have kind of a bunch of crops and maybe they start to get a good reputation with farmers. I mean that I, I bet they're making pretty good, money on those products they're they're interesting they're probably delicious honey nut squash is like a really cool idea that they did as well um so i don't know there's a balance there you know being able to kind of tailor it to more local markets that I, you can make money doing it so i can't really knock them for it but it's not everybody's strategy i'm not sure if i answered your question but no you did yeah that that's very interesting um Shabrina, for my next question, maybe we'll start with you. Um, and it's kind of a broad question, but I'm curious to hear um, what are some trends that you have your eye on in uh, food security? And is there anything that we should be ready for moving forward into the future of food security? Yeah, so it was really exciting to see while I was doing research on our own healthy corner store initiative that a lot of cities across the country have their own, like Philadelphia, Baltimore and Detroit. And it was really cool to see how they expanded those programs to include more urban agricultural prog like programs like uh, community gardens and mobile farmers markets. Mm -hmm. So I would say definitely keep an eye out because a lot of people are recognizing that food insecure communities are in vulnerable urban populations. And um, yeah, just definitely be, I'm definitely keeping an eye out as well on innovations like uh, vertical farming and on uh, major cities. I think it's really cool, again, like how we're adapting to um, like urban conditions that our world is unfortunately coming accustomed to. Yeah, that's very interesting. And we actually just had a question come in about um, vertical farming. So does anybody have any other thoughts on future innovations in the field or on vertical farming in particular? Yes, I do. Um, ahead, I love I love vertical farming. I think it's, it's a really, really awesome technology. Um, and when I actually first moved to New York, so I, I went to NYU and I studied um, ecology more or less. Um, I was really welcomed by the urban agriculture community, um, kind of separate of my university, just you know, meetups and events, things like this. Um, and I think I would encourage anyone that's getting into vertical farming, urban agriculture to consider, like I said before, the whole. Um, it is not a silver bullet solution at all. It will grow, you know, some percentage, maybe 25% of our food, best case, um, but we still need to rely on super um, Kind of well-defined and and thriving supply chains from rural communities um i mean the reason why urban uh the urban food system in new york which i know best uh is is so great um is because it has a great relationship with the hudson valley and farmers um up there so it's you know it's it's awesome you should you should definitely keep keep your eye out for vertical farming and um, other urban agricultural concepts. Um, a company that comes to mind that's really changing the game um, is Aero Farms. Uh, they're based in Newark, New Jersey, and they're easily like one of the largest vertical, uh, they do aquaponics, which is, uh, or not aquaponics, aeroponics. Um, which is kind of similar to hydroponics, but slightly different. And they have the, all this crazy patented technology. Um, examples like that are going to change our food food system, not little startups in Brooklyn like us that are, you know, growing small amounts of food, but like really how does it scale and how does it feed people um, in, a, in a small area? Great. Thanks, Parker. Um, so we have about seven more minutes and a lot of really good questions coming in. So I apologize to the audience if we don't get to all of them, um, but I'm gonna keep going through because I, I wanna fit in as many as we can. 
Um, so one really good question from the audience is, do you think a more food secure future means eating more plant-based foods and fewer animal source foods? Who would like to address that one? None of you? <laughs> I think, um, I know like animal agriculture, like you have to grow the plants that the animals eat. Um, so I, I think a move towards more like plant-based options um, would definitely be a need for the process. Um, I actually went vegetarian slash vegan uh, when I started my sustainability major just because all, just like having like the data in front of you, like, yeah, like this, this is not sustainable. So that was one of the things I did to like lower my carbon footprint. So I think that um, in this day and age with like um, having like the internet and stuff, I think more people would be open to like learning about like how their diet impacts the planet. And stuff. I hope, I hope that 3D printing meat becomes popular soon because I, I mean, it's just hard to compete with pork and lamb. I mean, it's delicious. Yeah. <laughs> but. I mean, the Impossible Burger and the Beyond Burger are pretty good. Um, I tried those, like, I've been vegetarian for, like, almost three years now, but I tried them, like, when I first went vegetarian, and I couldn't tell the difference, especially with the Impossible Burger. Nice. When I heard it's, like, chemically the same as meat, just about. So, I mean... They're getting better on like the alternative meats and stuff, so I feel like it will be easier once we have like more technology and stuff. Great, thanks, Sam. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see if I can fit in two more questions. Moving, moving on to the next one, then. Uh, with the reported increase in global famine, most heavily in developing areas of the world, what role can local efforts play to address large-scale famine? I, hope Maybe can. You, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I hope I hope something can be done. I guess that's a daunting question. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's a good question. I don't know how I don't know how much a garden can stop famine. <laughs> um, I think it's a step in the right direction to start some degree of community resilience, um, especially because sometimes when you do depend on outside sources for majority of your food. It gets troubling once costs get low or fortunately someone may not be able to ship off the stock of fruits and vegetables. So I think it's definitely in the right direction to kind of create a movement of eco-localism. Yeah, that's a great answer. Sure. I also, and um, I like the focus. Go ahead, Sam. I also think that uh, a part of that is also being able to like the efficacy around like preserving your food. I mean, I know how to like can vegetables. I mean, I mean, I'm from rural Kentucky. So like I've grown my own gardens and like I know how to can and pickle and like make like things like sauerkraut and stuff, but that's not like a common skill that a lot of people have about like preserving your food. So I definitely think like that kind of education might be more useful to prevent that because canned food lasts a lot longer and if you can can it yourself even better. Yeah, right. I'd, I'd like to echo that. Like in, in ecology, like when I was studying it, constraints always breed creativity. So like when you're short on food, you have to get super savvy about how you're gonna provide your next meal, um, whether you're human or an animal, as the same. Um, and I think like, yeah, the education piece, Sam, is super important because um, it's not only like practical, oh, now I can feed myself. It's also like unbelievably empowering. It's like, whoa, I grew that and now I can eat it and, and maybe I can save some for later. Um, and then maybe I can grow enough to support like my neighbors or my friends or like, um, you know, just kind of promoting yourself beyond a local grower for yourself but for your for your biome for your bioregion oh, definitely yeah it's a great great answer guys thank you um so we only have three minutes left and i'd like to uh transition to ending on a, a positive note um again it's the 50th anniversary of earth week and the theme of, of the 50th anniversary is focusing on action so i'd be interested to hear from each of you 
Uh, what's one thing that everybody attending to today can go out and do to uh, contribute something positive to global food security? And uh, with a shameless plug, you guys have all uh, participated in and been connected to the green program. So um, if there's anything you want to add about how that's impacted what you do now, um, that would be welcome as well. So Parker, let's start with you. And again, we have two minutes, so um, you're on the clock. <laughs> Talk to more farmers, learn how to grow food. And maybe if you're interested in joining, you know, some sort of food related industry, uh, try to join an organization that is working on food security specific uh, problems. Great. Shabrina? Uh, go to your favorite restaurants and ask how they manage food waste. Um, for example, we have a program with Panera Bread and we take food waste after and you'd be surprised how much food is left over and how much food can be given to families. Awesome. I love that. Sam? Um, I just want to like say something that um, relates to COVID-19 right now. Um, yeah. For like your local like restaurants right now, a lot of people are doing like takeout and like carry out um, orders only, like order from your favorite local restaurant. Like they have mouths to feed too. Um, I kind of lost my job uh, temporarily from COVID-19 because I um, worked at like a small ice cream shop and our location wasn't doing well because we're off the edge of campus and everybody's gone but like help like local businesses if you can um because that helps the local economy not corporate america yeah that's great sam um and and david any last words of advice um i i mean i think there was a it was a great example today of just and asking honest questions is a great way to move things forward um, you know, is this really not healthy for me? Is, is MSG actually bad or am I just brainwashed <laughs> or, um, I mean, is this really nutritious? I mean, is it not? Yeah, that's great. Always that's ask curiosity. questions. Yeah. Um, well, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us. Um, and I want to thank all of everybody in the audience for joining us as well. It's been a really interesting conversation. I appreciate all the questions coming in from the audience. Um, and I hope that everybody will remain engaged with the topic of global food security. As a reminder, the Green Program has one last session for our Earth Week panel series um, happening tomorrow at 12 p.m. So you can sign up for that at our website at thegreenprogram.com. And we look forward to seeing people there. Thanks, everybody. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Yeah, more than yes. welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining.